I'm Tim Pankhurst and I'm the recently retired conservation manager for the East of England with plant life. I was sort of nobbled by wildlife when I was four. My earliest memory is of seeing a blue tit for the first time and just thinking, wow, that's incredible. And that, that just started a lifelong passion for wildlife. And I think as soon as I started studying it, observing it closely, I realised that things weren't right. I, I don't think I really got interested in plants until my teens. But where I grew up as a very small boy, my parents bought a new house, a new estate on the Downs in, in Surrey. And the road verges hadn't been finished off, so they'd put in the curbstones and the pavements but all, the gap in between was just broken ru was chalk rubble. And I remember sitting on the curb and seeing a grass growing out of this rubble and thinking, that's amazing, that's beautiful. And it had these weird Chinese lantern-like flowers. And of course it was quaking grass. And I remember thinking it was just beautiful. And it still do. Um, and that, I'm sure that stayed with me. I don't remember where I got the poster from. It might have been a bookshop or something like that. And I didn't learn a great deal about fin orchid at the time, um, but I did learn about the broads because on my big AA book of British birds, there was a where to watch bird section at the back, and in the and in the back they had maps and there was the, the, the Norfolk broads, and it had all sorts of wonderful things like marsh harriers and bittens and things, and uh, and I remember thinking at the time, oh. That's where the fen orchids grow from my poster. And so maybe if I go there, I'll see one of them eventually. I didn't, I didn't quite anticipate it to what extent I might get involved with them, but uh, there's a long connection there. Why is fen orchid so special? Well, all plants are special for a start. So in plant life, of course, we, we know that. One of the interesting things about studying rarities and uh, things that are under threat is that when you study them, you realize that they have a broad range of narrow requirements so a lot of quite fine requirements but one of the perspectives you also pick up is that all the common things have a broad range of fine requirements as well it's just the things they need are there they fit in they dovetail with humanity and what we do whereas the things that suffer have requirements that don't dovetail with what humanity does but the other reason it stands out i think and it has a cousin in this is that most of these orchids and looking around this beautiful fen where we sit there are lots of brightly colored rather brassy pink and you know, glorious orchids everywhere but the fen orchid is small and green and understated and it hides under other vegetation and i just rather like that the fact that it, it doesn't show off the fen orchid was assessed in the first vascular plant red list which i think was 1975 and was assessed as being endangered. It was reassessed for the second one, endangered, and the third one, endangered. And when I started with plant life, a lot of the work involved fenland plants. It was all about trying to devise ways of improving the status of rare fen plants in East Anglia. And of course, fen orchid was on that list for, for those reasons. And because of that, I um, uh, joined the fen orchid species recovery program steering group and the lead partner then was the Norfolk Wildlife Trust and they asked us that if we would be interested in taking over the lead because I think they'd felt that they'd be, had the lead for some time and that it might you know a, a fresh face might might help so for us it started about 2008 when I joined that group and we took over the leadership and the rest speaks for itself in England it was at the time only known from three locations and the total English population was fewer than a thousand plants. The main cause of rarity has been habitat loss. Fens, where it grows, are rare places anyway, but uh, changes, really the industrial revolution and the advent of uh, mechanised farming um, meant that the demand in the main product from fens, which was fen litter or marsh hay, uh, fell away because it was used to be bundled up on a regular basis and sent into the towns and cities as fodder and bedding for horses. And with the advent of the internal combustion engine, all the horses disappeared. 
So the market for all this produce disappeared and so the fens into fell into dereliction. Many that were drained and ploughed and turned to other things. Some were just abandoned uh, and just lost through neglect. Um, and others were also abandoned, but somehow survived in some form. And the fen we, we sit in um, is an example of that because when I first came here in 1984, there was a bit of fen about the size of a tennis court just over there. And since then, everything you can see has been restored. It's been cut back and the trees removed and the fen mown and it's been restored from virtual extinction, which makes it suitable for reintroduction. But that is the general pattern. So we're now talking where mm, probably there were in the 1800s, 40 odd sites for, for the fen variety of fen orchid in, in England. Um, and of course it came down to three. And now we're talking about including reintroduction seven. There are no guarantees ever. You've got to put the work in. And of course, a big part of the work is finding out where, what its problem is. What, why is it rare? Trying to work out what made it disappear and what's stopping it recovering. And once you've done that, you're in a position to maybe guess whether or not it's doable. You come to develop theories about why it is in the state it is. And then as part of those theories, you develop notions of well, what might be done about some of those things. Each individual thing, if there are, if the habitats are in poor condition, what is wrong about the condition, and can it be helped? And in a big, big case, one big case, uh, the big thing that we felt was that many of the fens that it likes to live in were traditionally mown, and, and mowing fens is a uh, resource hungry and difficult business. So um, if we could encourage fens that were being mown, let's say, or burnt maybe uh, every few years, if they could be mown annually or every other year, then that would be an improvement. And we set up an experiment. So again, there's another thing. If you're going to try something you don't really know the answer to, you have to do it experimentally so that you learn properly from the outcome and you collect useful data. It's to do with experimental work. You say, we're going to set up an experiment that looks at this, and then you find that the plant responds in ways that you had anticipated. And that's really, really encouraging and exciting. One, because you're improving its condition, but two, because it shows that your work you've done is not been wasted, it's, it's, it's been fruitful. And that's very, very rewarding. The Suffolk Wildlife Trust have restored this fen from virtual destruction and they've done it beautifully and that has made it possible for us to try and reintroduce the plant here because this is the last place from which it disappeared back in 1975 I think it was last seen and it's now here again because of their decades of work it's difficult to describe but as when you're retiring and you see something you've been working on all these years cuts almost almost not it's never quite as good as he wanted to be but let's say it's there's success there and uh that's that's uh comforting i hope the fin orchids there'll be large self-sustaining populations of fin orchids in a dozen fens in East Anglia. I'd also like to see them return, the June variety return to Broughton Burrows in a viable condition and the populations in Wales to be uh, self-sustaining and large as they were. But there's a lot of work there to be done, but I think it can be done. The biggest hope I would have is that the lessons that can be learned from conservation of fin orchid can be applied to other things.